So we've been talking about Newton's universal law of gravitation and uh, the force of attraction between any two objects, if we know their masses and the distance between them can be found now. And that's because Cavendish was able to find the universal gravitational constant. Newton figured out the ratio of masses and distance, but Cavendish found the universal gravitational constant, which we found to be 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. That tells us that you need to have a serious amount of mass to really see or, or really feel a noticeable effect of force of attraction. We can see the uh, force of attraction when things are moved towards each other if they're really massive. In fact, if you were to take a, uh, like a wrecking ball, a really massive wrecking ball, and hang it from a cable right next to a building, those two have enough mass so the cable would not be totally vertical, but we couldn't measure it unless we had really, really precise instruments. So we need really a large amount of mass to even start to have noticeable effect. And that's why our biggest gravitational field or source of gravitation is the Earth because that's the most massive object near us. All right. But um, up to this point, we've talked about the effect of gravity. Um, and now gravity, remember, is the force of attraction. So big G is not gravity. And up until this unit, we've talked about little g. So the question is, what is little g? Well, as you might have noticed, I've never referred to little g as gravity. I've always referred to it as the acceleration that gravity causes or the acceleration of gravity. And that is found, Galileo first found that by looking at things falling and using one dimensional motion to find that acceleration rate. Where does that come from? And that's what we want to look at. So if we look at that, um, we know that at different points around the Earth, the acceleration rate is different. And it is based on how far away from the planet we are. The closer to the center of the planet we are, the greater the acceleration of gravity. So when we get farther and farther away, the less. And that's because when that gets bigger, the force of attraction on something gets smaller. Okay? Um, but, uh, so we have to remember that gravitation, or little g is the acceleration that gravity causes. We can also call that the gravitational field strength. And we can, we can talk about that in terms of newtons per kilogram. Up until now, we've talked about it in terms of meters per second per second, what it does to things. Now we can talk about it in terms of force. Newtons per kilogram. How many newtons one kilogram of mass is attracted to the Earth by? And we know that the farther away from Earth, the less force there is. So gravitational field strength just tells us how strong the gravitational field is at that distance from an object. You have a gravitational field strength. I have a gravitational field strength. The Earth's gravitational field strength is by far the most obvious one to us because when we drop something, it falls to Earth. If we had something nearly as massive as Earth, uh, it might not fall quite as fast, but um, it would fall, all right? So little g changes based on where we are in the universe. Big G is universal, stays the same. So let's look at the relationship there. If we look at little g, we know these two formulas, uh, and we've used this formula here a lot. That's the weight of an object. Um, and now we know this formula here, which is a force of attraction between any two objects. So this is where we can say, okay, uh, the other day when I was talking about sometimes you see this formula written differently, you might see it written Fg equals G big M little m over R squared. Um, well, the big M refers to the mass of the Earth, the mass of a large object versus the mass of a smaller object. But remember, when we talk about weight and we talk about force of attraction, well, weight is the force of attraction between the object and the Earth, and this is the force of attraction between the object and the Earth, so we can set those two things equal to each other. When we do that, 
we see that we've got a mass on each side that's the same. And the mg is the mass of the object uh, times acceleration of gravity, or the gravitational field strength, which we're going to use in this unit more. Um, and mo is the mass of the object as well. So those two masses actually cancel out. When we cancel those two masses out, now we see why things accelerate down at the rate that they do. And we also see that that mass of the object that accelerates towards Earth doesn't matter. That's why that cancels out. So we have a formula now that tells us the uh, mass of the Earth and how far away from the center of the Earth is what matters. And that's what we have here with g equals gm over r squared. And you'll oftentimes see this written um, with a big M, but it doesn't really matter. So the mass of the object that it is attracted to, not the mass of the object that's being that's falling towards the Earth. So this tells us why things accelerate at the rate that they do, because there's a certain amount of force for every mat, for every kilogram of that object's mass that is pulling on that object. And since we know that F equals MA, and A is an acceleration, that's where the G comes from. All right, so the gravitational field strength at the surface of the Earth, if we use the values that we had before, the mass of the Earth that we calculated the other day based on one kilogram worth of mass and its force attracted to the Earth, the radius of the Earth gives us the reason things accelerate down is because for every kilogram of mass of an object, there's 9.81 newtons worth of force at the surface of the Earth. Now, as you go farther away from the Earth, as this number gets bigger, little g gets smaller. If we were to able, able to shrink the Earth down so the surface of the Earth were closer, little g would be bigger. And the thing to remember, though, is that the Earth is not a perfect sphere. As much as we want to think that it is, because of the rotation of the Earth, it actually scrunches down at the poles and expands at the equator. It's not a huge amount. It's very close to spherical, but because of the rotation, it is an oblate spheroid, I believe it's called. I forget exactly the name of it, but it's scrunched down. Um, and so the poles are a little bit closer to the center of the Earth than the equator. All right. So we actually have a slight difference in radius, which means if you're standing at the farthest point from the from the center of the Earth, you're actually on Mount Chimborazo, which is a mountain on the equator, I believe, in Ecuador, um, in South America. That is a point that's farthest away from the surface or from the center of the Earth, not Mount Everest. And the reason it's not Mount Everest, Mount Everest is the highest point above sea level, but it's not the farthest up from the center of the Earth because its latitude is too far north. All right. Um, and then the closest point on the surface of the Earth, well, technically not a, it's on the surf where land is, but there's, it's underwater, would be the bottom of the ocean of the Arctic. So that would be um, a slight difference there. So you see here 6.384 times 10 to the 6 meters versus 6.353 times 10 to the 6 meters. Not a huge difference, but it's enough. So if we want to find what G is at those extremes, we can plug it into our little g formula. The mass of the Earth hasn't changed, but you can see that the range of um, gravitational field strengths at the surface of the Earth ranges from 9.77 newtons per kilogram up to 9.87 newtons per kilogram. The average is 9.81 because that's the average distance away from the center of the Earth. But uh, that is what we're looking at there. All right. So that tells us why. It's based on the mass of the Earth and uh, the distance from the Earth. So we can find the acceleration due to gravity or the gravitational field strength at any point in space, whether we're on a surface of something 
or away from something. So the farther away from the Earth we get, the less gravity's pulling on us. Now, there's never a point where we get to the point where there's zero pull. And that's where I want to talk about potential energy. Up to this point, we've talked about gravitational potential energy in um, with the MGH formula. And that is great when the G is not changing from 9.81. So within about 30 miles of the surface of the Earth, it works fine. So we're generally not outside of that 30 miles of the surface of the Earth, so we don't have to worry about it. But um, because little g changes, MGH would change as well. And we would have to use calculus and all kinds of different things to do that. And what MGH really tells us using that for gravitational um, potential energy is a relative change in the potential energy from one spot to another using the surface of the Earth as the zero point. In actuality, if you think about it, the farther away from the Earth you get, the less the gravitational pull of Earth is affecting something. So the less energy it has uh, to come back. In other words, energy has been put into it to get it farther away. So if you look at this graph here, we see that, technically speaking, if we are an infinite distance away, we would have zero potential to come back to Earth. And the closer to Earth we get, the less potential energy there is. So technically speaking, we always have zero potential, or we're always, not zero, we always have negative potential energy in comparison to that. Um, so if we look at the surface of the Earth, there is, uh, an, we have to put energy in to get away. The farther away from the Earth we get, the less energy we have to put in. So technically speaking, what we're doing is comparing uh, an infinite distance away where there's zero potential energy to closer where there's more potential energy um, that's been lost. So that's where this formula comes in. Now remember, we had U equals MGH, but this G changes when R changes. All right, so if we're talking about gravitational potential energy from a distance farther away than 30 miles from the surface of the Earth, we have to use this formula here. And what it really does is tell us the overall potential energy that an object has. And it's basically telling us, you can see here, um, it depends on the mass of the object, so that's still there. It depends on the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth. It's not the same as the force of gravitation because it's not a radius squared type of thing. It's not an inverse squared thing. But it tells us how much energy is lost as this goes down. And you get less and less negative. Or more and more negative, I should say. But if we go from one spot like here to here, notice you go from here to here on this graph you've gained energy because you're getting less negative. An infinite distance away would be zero. Closer and closer, you get more and more negative potential energy. And that's where we have this. So if we were to take MGH, uh, we have this line here, right there, and we see that that is what we assume if G never changes. But since G changes, little g, not big G, since little g changes based on radius or distance away from the Earth, we have to take that into account, and that's what we have here. Um, so as you can see right there, when, the, when we're close to the radius of the Earth, they're the same value. But the farther away from, from the Earth we get, the more these two values diverge, all right? So when we talk about a gain in potential energy, it's a gain from a negative value to a negative value. 
but it's less of a negative value. And so to gain that potential energy, you have to give it enough kinetic energy to get out there. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I do have some problems for you guys to work out on that. And uh, we're going to start talking about how that applies in terms of getting away from the earth, which is escape velocity, and how we understand orbits to work on our next lesson. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. We'll see ya.